Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Mary's cute with her pigtails. I uh, yeah. <laughs> haven't seen Mary with pigtails yet. So <laughs> but anyway. Um, so I, I just feel it's really wonderful that those kind of things are happening and, and people are exercising their desire and passion. And there's been quite a number of people who've said, oh, we really want to do that into like these other languages, Spanish, Russian, French and other languages. And of course, as that occurs, then obviously that gives a chance for the divine truth to grow in those particular countries as well and languages. So that's, that's really wonderful. So, and if you just bear in mind that every single thing you do that enhances divine truth is sort of like, and I mentioned this in the pageant messages, it's sort of like a crown of glory for your own soul. And when you pass into the spirit world, what happens is that all the things you've done that were done in an altruistic manner in order to help others gain truth and love, every one of those people who, um, every one of the people who have been affected by what you've done know you. And oftentimes when people arrive in the spirit world, well, like when James Paget arrived in, the, arrived in the spirit world, there were literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people who were there waiting to talk to him and just thank him for what, they, what th happened for them. Um, so, and if you can imagine that, it's a very overwhelming experience. A lot of times we don't know the true effects of what we do until we arrive in the spirit world and see the results. By the way, oftentimes we don't know the true effects of what we do in a negative way either until we arrive in the spirit world and see the results. Now, obviously, everything you do that's done in harmonious with truth and love, that obviously has beautiful results for your soul, um, both now and also in the spirit world. So, um, and I've personally been on the recipient uh, of a lot of appreciation in the past and, and I understand how overwhelming that is emotionally. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure uh, that when you experience the same thing, you'll understand how overwhelming emotionally that is for you. Can I rub it off, Brian, now? Is that all right? This is sort of like a work of art already. Yeah. So. Leave the stick figures. Leave the stick figures, you want know? <laughs> a reminder. So how did you find after going home yesterday, for those of you who were here yesterday, about the soulmate discussion, how did you find things yesterday. Can, um, oh, by the way, I just need to, we need to get microphones happening, so let's do that. Who would like to do this side? You'd like to, Monica? Thank you. And who would like to do that side? You'd like to, you can use it first. Yeah. So. It's on. Oh. Um, yesterday morning I left my husband after 30 years. And... Um, yesterday morning? Yes. And... I knew that it was something I needed to do because right. I was in an unloving situation and I knew that I no longer really loved him and so I wasn't living in truth. Yep. But it was still very hard and it was still very sad, yep. which I'm obviously still feeling. Yep. Um, and then I came here and you're talking about soulmates. <laughs> 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 yep. So I just have a couple of questions. Why is it so hard and why is it so sad? And also... Um, a discussion we were having in the ladies yesterday yeah. was... <laughs> not with me, obviously. <laughs> no, obviously not with you. Yeah. And um, nobody would ask, ask the question, so I said, I will. Yeah. If you have a longing for your soulmate and you know who your soulmate is, yeah. but they're married, is that unloving? Yes, yeah, so that's brought up quite a number of questions. The problem with a soulmate discussion, if I can... Uh, I'm going to answer this question in a fairly long-winded way, okay? <laughs> Uh, so, sorry about that for those of you who want to ask further questions. Um, the problem with this soulmate discussion is that we often go a number of different ways with it. And when we go, one, one way we can go with it is, all right, we feel we're not currently in a relationship that's with our soulmate, right? That might be one way we go with it. And so, once we go that way, like that we're not in this relationship with our soulmate, we then have a, have a choice of what we want to do uh, and what, what are we going to do. My suggestion, though, is rather than focusing on the soulmate issue in your current relationship, is to just focus on the love issue in your current relationship, right? Because, because at the end of the day, if you're with a person and it's not love, then it's some other emotional reason, right? So, so 
So let's say I'm the male in the relationship, right? And here's the woman in the relationship. It's not Mary because I'm going to leave this woman. And, uh, <laughs> and I, decide, um, I decide that actually either I do not love this woman anymore or this woman does not love me anymore even though I'm still in love with her. Right? Now if that happens, immediately from God's perspective the bond between us has broken because every bond from God's perspective is a love-based bond. So any true bond is really just a love-based bond from God's perspective. Any other bond that we have with any person is just usually, as we talked about yesterday, an addictive bond, right? an addiction, which is, and remember an addiction is actually the satisfaction of an unhealed emotion that's out of harmony with love. So the addiction might be, I need to feel secure. So that's the addiction. And that comes from this unsatisfied emotion that I don't want to release inside of me, which is I feel very unsafe and insecure unless a man's looking after me or a woman's looking after me. An addiction might be, I need someone to cook and clean for me. It can be a simple little addiction. Many men, their entire life, have not cooked or cleaned. And it might sound a bit strange, but it's true. I've met many of them, right? They've never cooked or cleaned because they went straight from home, living with mum who cooked and cleaned for them, and straight into a relationship where the woman cooked and cleaned for them, right? And they never have even cooked and cleaned. They don't even really know how to cook a meal for themselves, many of them. Now, in many countries, this is the case where whole populations of men don't even know how to cook for themselves. So one of their addictions is obviously going to be needing the woman to do it for them. Does that make sense? Just a simple addiction like that, which comes from an unhealed emotion where they're not willing to take responsibility for their own life and their own, uh, and their, their own body even. It's a big emotional injury actually that drives that. So we have, let's say, an addiction. The addiction causes us to remain connected to the person. From God's perspective though, if I don't love this person and I don't passionately desiring this person, and this person doesn't really matter whether they passionately desire me or not, if I just don't passionately desire that person and love that person, then I have at this point two things to do. One is that I could work through the emotional injury-based reasons as to why I no longer passionately desire the person at one point I must have. Perhaps passionately desired. Does that make sense? We have to let them in. They obviously needed the door, those spirits. It's just a bit of breeze coming. <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm just joking. Yeah. So, so do you understand that? Like, so if I don't passionately desire this person, my first option is to actually look at some emotional reasons of why I might not passionately desire them. Now, one emotional reason might be that this person has done something in the past in our relationship which has caused me to be in a state of fear or anger about the relationship. So this person might have cheated on me or they might have flirt, flirted with other men or they might have done something like that, right? Which has caused me to have certain emotional responses inside of myself and then as a result of those emotional responses inside of myself, I've shut down myself towards them. Right? So instead of releasing the emotion, as would we do if we were on the divine love path, we have this habit instead of closing down our emotion, staying in the relationship, but feel we have this hurt in us about the relationship. Does that make sense? And so that person, I could be blocked towards that person just because of that one issue, that there is this anger in me or frustration in me or fear in me about what they've done maybe even 10 years ago or 15 years ago could be something a long term like that and often is. My suggestion before you ever leave anybody in a relationship is to start addressing the issues like that. So if there is an issue in the past where the person's cheated or the person's done something that has caused a lot of like blockages in yourself, a lot of shutdown, let's say they've been a little bit abusive in the past or maybe when they get drunk they get angry with you all the time or those kind of things. 
my suggestion is to deal with every one of those issues in truth. Remember the three things. Truth is such an important thing. Deal with it in truth and in humility, right? In humility would say, all right, that's my law of attraction. I need to deal with something inside of myself emotionally as to what went on there. And in truth, I would speak to the other person and say, like, I am still upset with the fact that you did that. Right? I am still angry about that or I'm still sad about that. I still have some grief. And what I've done is I've blocked myself off from you emotionally now because of that. I realise that's my issue and I need to work through that, but I don't feel that you are even sorry for what you did, that if that might be the feeling you have and so forth. So explain what's going on with the person and try to work through the issue with them. Now, in the attempt of trying to work through the blocked emotion with them, you, it will become very clear very rapidly whether the person wants to do that with you or not. All right? Now, if the person doesn't want to do that with you, it, it will become very obvious that they have no desire to actually deal with this particular thing in truth. And therefore, you're going to have to work through the issue yourself at some point and uh, by yourself, because if you want to be close to God, you're going to have to work through this issue, whether the other person's sorry for what they did or not, right? You're still going to have to work through the issue. But then you'll have to start looking if, if they are getting angry in return back at you or they are getting like uh, pressuring or controlling or manipulative back in return with you, what are you going to do then? Obviously, that's not loving behaviour either and you would have to start to address that issue. Does that make sense? So, in starting to address that issue, it would become very clear over time whether you should be with this person or not. Right? But if there is no love... Remember, love is the real bond between the two of you. If you know that you are no longer in love with this person, from God's perspective, the bond is broken. If you know that that person no longer loves you, then from God's perspective, the bond is broken. It doesn't matter whether you've got a marriage certificate, and it doesn't matter how long that marriage certificate has stood for, the bond is broken. Now you have one of two choices. You can re-establish the bond of love by working through it in truth and in humility and in love with the person, or you can separate. That's your choice really, isn't it, in the end. Now, the problem is that a lot of people are going to then say about me that, oh yeah, you know, he went along to, or she went along to AJ's sessions for a year, or in Joy's case, five months or six months or whatever, and look what she's done now. She's left her, her husband after 30 years of marriage, like AJ destroys marriages. Right? That's the next supposition that comes from that, right? Now, I know Joy doesn't personally feel that, but what, whenever Joy has asked me a personal question about relationships, I've always referred her back to this particular thing. What, what's about the love? You know, what, do, are you in love with this man? Is he loving towards you? And what's going on? And if you can deal with those issues, it will then become very plain whether this relationship can work even if you're soulmates or not. Now, if you know you are not soulmates, which is a lot different than hoping that you're not, or hoping that you are, right? If you know you are not soulmates, and in fact you know who your soulmate is, and you know that you're not in love with the person you're with, then why are you still there? And my suggestion is there will be a lot of emotional reasons why you're still there. So I'm not <laughs> suggesting you leave. What I'm suggesting is stick around and deal with those emotional reasons until you get to a point of making a decision inside of yourself as to what you should do. All right? Now, what might be some of the emotional reasons why I might stay with someone who I know doesn't love me? Well, one might be that I love them. And I still feel that feeling for them. And so I stay with them, hoping. So what am I addicted to? Hope, in the end. I'm hoping that they're going to love me at some point in the future. Right? And that if I do enough for them, and if I please them enough, and, I, and all that, eventually they'll come to see that I'm a nice guy, and, and, and they'll love me. Or a nice woman, and they'll love me. Now, is that loving to yourself? Obviously not. So I would have to also, in this question of love, look at, am I being loving to myself by staying here? 
If you know that your partner doesn't love you, but you stay in the relationship, then there is obviously some quite strong emotional addictions to allow yourself to work through. Work through those addictions in the relationship if you can, because you've attracted the relationship. It's a perfect time to work through them. Work through those addictions, and when you come out the other side of those addictions and release them, it will become very plain to you whether it's a workable relationship or not. But the issue that we raised yesterday was, in fact, I was suggesting to you yesterday, there is a soulmate part of you. It's this soulmate side of you. When you start opening this soulmate side of you, what will happen is every other attraction that you've ever had will start to die. And when I say die, it's not like some kind of destruction that's terrible. You just no longer feel attracted to lots of different people anymore. There is only one person you end up being attracted to, and that is your soul other half, your soul mate. And so what happens when that happens is you get into this state where you realise that there is only one kind of attraction that really has any long-term hunger for you, long-term longing for you, and that is the hunger for your soul mate, the longing for your soul mate. Now, when you get into that state, it will become very obvious to you whether the person you're currently with is your soulmate or not. Until that point, until you actually have a soulmate longing, you are not going to know whether the person you're with is your soulmate or not. Even if they are your soulmate, you still won't know until that part of your soul is opened. And this is why it's so good to use, to be in your current relationship and work through the issues until you get to the point where you know that this isn't right. And when you know it isn't right, obviously that is the time for you to leave. And it doesn't matter what anybody else around you says. Like The religious people around you might say, no, you married for life, you've got to stick with that. Your husband or wife might say, oh, hang on a sec, but I still love you. That doesn't matter either. Because at the end of the day, when you know inside of yourself that you no longer have love, uh, you know, a desire, a loving, and, and by the way, this includes a sexual desire for your partner, then there is something wrong going on inside of yourself that you're shutting down and you need to look at that. Because at the end, we do need to have this strong emotional sexual desire for our partner that we're living with. And if we don't have that, we need to spend a lot of time looking at why. Right? Because when two people in a relationship don't desire every, each other in a passionate way, it actually shuts each person down emotionally in the relationship. Now, any of you who have lived in that kind of relationship know that, right? As soon as you start detuning from your partner sexually and emotionally, why are you now in the relationship? And now it just becomes like almost like a friendship that you could have with a guy down the street sort of thing, isn't it? And once the sexual relationship stops and the emotional relationship stops, what's going on now? It's really just like a workable solution to some kind of problem that you're still not letting go of inside of yourself. So my suggestion is allow yourself to understand that your life will change as you follow the divine love path. Right? It's going to change and it's not going to be my fault. Many of you think it is my fault, and many other people who watch you doing what you're doing think it's my fault, but it actually isn't going to be my fault. It's going to be God's truth resonating in your soul so much that eventually you feel you can do certain things and can't do other things. And then you'll feel drawn into doing that yourself. And, and I'll have nothing to do with that process, aside from the on occasion that you might even ask me what's the loving thing to do, and I'll just ask you some questions. I, I am not recommending here to anybody to leave their per, the person they're with or to stay. What I'm asking you to do is to live in love and to do that in a passionate way. And if you can't do that in a passionate way, look at the emotional reason why you can't that's inside of yourself and then you'll address a lot of the issues. Now, obviously for Joy, you've been working through this issue. You've felt there's a disconnection of love between yourself and your partner. Is that right? Do you, do you mind? Yeah, that would be true. That would be true? Yeah. And so that's caused you then to go, okay, what am I doing in this relationship when it's not loving? And part of the question you ask is, why am I then grieving 
the fact that I've left the relationship. Well, oftentimes when we act in truth, once we realise the truth and we actually act upon the truth, all of the addictions start getting triggered one after the other quite rapidly. So one of the addictions that you know that you've had is this addiction to security, right? In terms of like uh, um, economic security. Yeah, just leaving my home and garden and chooks and... Yeah, yeah. There's been an attachment to your home, right? Which in this process, have you left or...? Yes. Yes, so you left your home as well. Um, so there's an attachment to that. There's this, in, in the guy's case, there might be an acknowledgement, oh, everything that's been created, I'm going to have to split into half. And there's this great big feeling of, but I created that. And now half of it's gone. Like, there's some big loss. So there's a lot of ty loss type emotions, grieving style emotions that we'll go through. Obviously, we can't live 30 years of life and then just walk away from that without actually feeling quite a lot of loss about what was created in that 30 years. Does that make sense? But the key is to have the courage to still live in truth. Right? And to stay in truth. Now, what I've noticed a lot happen is um, people sometimes meet their soulmates. I'll just turn that off. Actually. Yes. Um, people sometimes meet their soulmates and then they use that as an excuse to do all sorts of immoral things. Now what I mean by that is they use that as an excuse to have an affair, an excuse to still live with a partner they don't love because they get <coughs> meal on the table and a, and a, you know, or a safe and secure environment to live in. They use it as an excuse to do all sorts of unjustified immoral things. Now, if we are really living in truth, we would never be able to do that. So the moment that you met your soulmate and you were in a different relationship, you'd be going, okay, I know this person's my soulmate because of all these different things that I feel with this person. Why am I now treating this person in an unloving way? You see, as soon as I start sacrificing love of the person that I was with, can you see I'm out of harmony with divine love straight away? Now, in that state, all these spirits around you can start hooking in to this untruthful state you're in. And, and unfortunately, in that state, this is where children get hurt, you know, family members get hurt and so forth. The truth is that you can meet your soulmate and still be in another relationship and work through the issues and stay in a state of love and truth and it will not damage your children at all emotionally. Uh, you can do that. But the majority of people don't. What the majority of people to finish up doing is one or both start getting angry and upset with each other, right, for the discoveries that they've made. Before you know it, they're at loggerheads with each other, throwing stuff at each other, not physically perhaps, but certainly emotionally, trying to get other people to influence their opinion about the other person that they used to be with. And before you know it, the children, which are unfortunately like the people watching and living with all of these emotions flying back and forth, are the ones getting damaged the most. If both parents own their emotions in a relationship, and if the relationship disbands because of different discoveries each person makes, discoveries really in the end are discoveries about love, aren't they? If they both remain in a loving state and in truth, no harm whatsoever will come to their children. But the problem is that most of the time we do not stay in a state of love and truth. We go into a state of anger, resentment, frustration, annoyance, rage, hatred. And under all of those circumstances, there is huge damage done to children as a result. So you can actually go through the process of realising that actually your current relationship is not the relationship that you want for the rest of your existence. And you can leave that relationship in the most loving possible way and go through lots of grief as a result of leaving it because of the addictions that were there before. It will confront every one of those addictions. And if you're willing to face all of those things emotionally, you cannot damage any other person or your own soul in the process. 
Conversely, you can meet your soulmate, enter into an affair with them, damage the relationship with the person that you're with by lying to them and cheating on them, damage the children by lying to them and cause all sorts of mayhem if you don't live in harmony with truth and love with regard to that process. And the, really the choice is up to yourself when you go through all of this. And we've got to really start addressing the emotional reasons inside of ourselves as to why we would like to do it that way. So as soon as you emotionally and sexually connect to another person other than the person you're living with in a, in a, in a relationship, straight away you have broken the bond of love between yourself and the person you're living with from God's perspective. The bond is broken. You can re-establish that bond by working through the emotions. So, you, you know, you may realise through the process that oh, actually I do love my partner and that I was just angry or I was afraid of this or I was needing security that I didn't have or whatever well, the real emotional reason was and work through that. And then you'd have to also work through the issues of being repentant and sorrowful if you chose to do that with that partner. But the truth is, is if you act honourably and with integrity in each situation and openly and honestly in each situation, then that is the least amount of chance for damage or danger in your relationship and also with your children being harmed as well if you have children. Now, there was a third part of your question. Uh, I can't quite remember it now again. It was like... Um, if you know who your soulmate is and you long for that soulmate, yep. but they're in, a, they're in a marriage, then when does that become un unloving, just by longing for them? Yep, it's a very good question, isn't it? Like, what's the difference between longing for somebody and then start developing a, an emotional relationship with that person? And uh, how does that affect the situation? So, all right. Now let's first look at it from the point of view that I'm in a relationship as well. So I start off in a relationship and they're in a relationship because we'll just extend it a little. So I'm in a relationship and I realise that my partner's not my soulmate and I work through a lot of my soulmate based emotions and eventually the two of us start realising because we might be working through together that we're not soulmates and we decide that we're going to break up. Right? So we go through that process emotionally. Now obviously if I stay in love and truth with this person, that process will happen in the best possible manner that it could happen. Now of course if the person themselves are not happy with that choice, then there's going to be some projections of anger and rage at me, isn't there? So if I'm making the choice unilaterally, then obviously the other person is going to be quite upset about that. Now they will need to work, if they were on the divine love path, they would need to work through their emotions about that. If they're not on the divine love path and all they feel they can do is just da damage my by hurling emotions, then I would have to work my way through those emotions that are a part of my law of attraction. You see, a lot of times we've lived in relationships for many years where we haven't loved them. right? And there is a certain compensation involved in that process. Once I come to terms with the fact that I haven't loved them and I go to tell them, and they say, well, how long have you loved me? And I say, oh, 10 years. <laughs> of course they're going to be hurt, aren't they? They've been in a relationship for 10 years with someone who hasn't loved them, who they thought loved them. So of course they're going to have some emotions about that and of course they're going to have some anger about that and of course it's in a way you could say it's almost justified anger, isn't it, towards us because we have actually harmed 10 years of their life by not telling them 10 years ago that that's how we felt. Can you see that? So I've actually affected their free will by not telling them the truth about how I felt 10 years ago. So obviously there's going to be some kind of back uh, stuff coming back from that person to me. And if I'm humble and I'm open and I'm loving, I'll work through all of that and I'll feel repentant for that because I'm going to need to feel repentant for that, affecting somebody's life for 10 years without them knowing. Right? I'm going to need to be repentant for that. So I go through all of that emotionally and I come out the other end where I'm separated from my partner, whoever my partner was, and I'm now like an individual. And I keep working my way through my emotion stuff and then I start having these realisations of who my soulmate is and yes, it just feels really certain to me. But it just so happens that my soulmate, who in this case I'll give is a woman, is in a marriage. So there she is. 
And she is in a marriage. What do I do? Do I develop a soulmate longing for her? And what is a soulmate longing anyway? Because that's really part of the question, isn't it? Well, what a soulmate longing is, is me dealing with all of my emotional injuries towards both genders. So I'd have to deal with all my emotional injuries towards the male and all of my emotional injuries towards the female. And what will happen at the soul level, not at the physical level or the intellectual level, but at the soul level now, I'm pushing out this energy that I have healed a lot of my, and obviously not all of them, but I've healed a lot of my issues about myself as a person and I've also emotionally healed a lot of my issues about women generally. Now what will happen when I'm in that state is that every single person around me will know that these changes have happened, not by me telling them, but by feeling them from me. So every woman will come up and say, gee, you're a bit different than when I saw you last time, you know. Last time I felt quite a lot of anger from you. And I'd say, oh yeah, well I dealt with a lot of anger about women and stuff like that and I worked my way through that. And they say, yeah, well, you're a lot more different than you used to be. And then other persons will come up and say, you know, before you used to always backpedal as a man and you used to always, you know, be conciliatory to the woman, but now I see you taking more, like, control of your own life, you know, looking after yourself where you always wanted a woman to look after you before and I think it's really good and yeah I dealt with this emotion, I dealt with that emotion and, and now I've, uh, you know, I've worked my way through those issues and now it feels quite different for me. Just you dealing with your emotions means that every single person around you will feel a difference in you. Now many of you have already started experiencing that, right? Now sometimes they see a difference in you and they don't like it very much because many of them are addicted to what you were before. Right? But they still notice that you have changed and that's a really good sign. When you're changing and it's a really good sign that things are improving. Wanna... I just wanted to... Um ask about the, di I feel like there's a difference between dealing with all of your injuries and developing a longing because I, yeah, I have... Yeah, that's what I'm trying to describe. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, yeah. I jumped the gun. That's all right. My soulmate's one step ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time my soulmate's ten steps ahead of me and she just <laughs> doesn't say anything. Yeah, so, so what I'm describing now is I'm dealing, I've dealt with a lot of my emotional injuries. Now what's coming out of me now is this openness towards my soulmate. Do you follow me? Because I've dealt with a lot of the injuries towards the masculine and towards the feminine inside of myself, now there's this openness towards the reception of my soulmate. Now my soulmate's going to feel that. There's nothing I can do to stop that from happening. She's going to feel that occur. It doesn't matter whether she's in a relationship or not in a relationship, she is still going to feel something going on some changes will start happening in her own life. Because remember, this soulmate at the soul level is just one half of me. So how could she not feel what I'm going through in the changes that I'm making towards her? She's definitely going to feel it. Now, at this point, I could start having a longing, I don't, might not even know, it depends on whether I know who she is or don't know who she is at this point. Let's say I don't know who she is. I could then start just developing a longing that I meet her and connect with her at the soul level, couldn't I? Now, the truth is, I don't know whether she's married, she's single, you know, she might be in a, a lesbian relationship, she might have, you know, five guys on the hook at the same time, I don't know, right? I don't know what she's going to be like really at this point aside from what I can feel from her. Right? But I'm still allowed to have my desires, aren't I? Am I not? Of course I am. I'm allowed to have my desires, so I'm allowed to have a desire or a longing for my soulmate. And I don't know the situation she's in. She might be in all, you know, all sorts of situations, who really knows. 
The fact is that because I've healed the majority of the emotions that are within me, there's an automatic thing of there's an automatic openness between myself and her now that's there that she has to feel because she's the other half of me. The other thing is that uh, because of that automatically openness and because now I'm starting to develop a longing for my soulmate, she's going to feel that too. And then things will start, whether she knows me or not, things will start changing in her life as a result of that if she's sensitive emotionally to this going on. She will start feeling like things are not quite right in her current relationship in some way and she'll start feeling all different things inside of herself about things not being quite right for herself. And she'll start going through these emotions. And I don't need to know her at this point. I don't even need to know who she is. That will be an automatic part of the process because that's how God designed it to be. Now, the, different, the question really is about whether I know her or not now, isn't it? Can you see that? Up until this point, I, let's assume I don't know her. Does, does that sound all right to you? Does that sound loving? that I develop my own soul desire, that I long for my own soul mate. She's the other half of me. Other, like, of course I've got a right to long for the other half of me, have I not? And so I, I, that's a loving thing. I can long for the other half of me. I've worked through my emotional injuries, so that means that I'm now not projecting at her neediness or control or manipulation or any of those things. I'm not trying to force her in any way to do what I want. Because that would be unloving too, wouldn't it? And that would mean I'd need to deal with that emotion inside of me too. So by this stage, I've, I've healed quite a lot of my stuff. So from a sphere's perspective, I'd be probably third sphere, fourth sphere, maybe fifth sphere of the spirit world at this point where I've dealt with quite a lot of my emotional injuries at this point. Now, I know that it ideally doesn't happen this way, so we'll put the, we'll put the other ways that all this can happen over there for a moment. Here what I'm describing is how I am focusing on my own healing and as a result of me focusing on my own healing and my own relationship with God, my desire for my soulmate will grow inside of myself and there's no one to project it to because I don't even know who they are and my desire will just continue to grow but my soulmate will feel this longing obviously because she's the other half of me. So. What happens now if I know who she is? Now there's some moral issues involved, isn't there? Particularly if she's in a relationship. But even if I know who she is and she's not in a relationship, there's still some moral issues involved, actually. Because let's say, for a start, that she's not in a relationship. What could I do? Well, I could start phoning her and ringing her and emailing her and saying we should hook up and whatever or get together or at least meet. What is that doing right at that moment? I'm now projecting my needs onto her. Isn't this now a loving thing? No. What would be better is for me just to say, could I meet up with you? I have something to tell you. So you go up and you sit down with her and say, I've done a lot of emotional work over the last few years, you know, and, and I've worked my way through this. I'm not in a relationship anymore. I've worked my way through this and that and whatever other things that I've worked my way through. And what I've come to realise is that there's actually one person that God's created for me, which is my soul mate, my other half, if you like. And what I've come to realise is that it's you. <laughs> was, was that your line to Mary? No. No, I'll tell you what my lines to Mary was uh, <laughs> as, some, uh, as a part of the discussion. But, but so I've come to realise that it's you. And... Um, and I don't want you to do anything about it. I'm just telling you because I want, to tell, I want to tell you and I want to give you the opportunity to know. That's it. As soon as I project an expectation upon them that they then act upon the knowledge that I've just given them, straight away I'm out of harmony with divine love. Does that make sense? So... One thing, it's one thing to just say the truth. I know you're my soulmate. Quite another than to say, can we get together? Now what I'm doing is projecting an expectation upon them and I'm not leaving the choice up to them as to what they want to do about that information. Does that make sense? No? And I'll just keep going with the, this question before I ask another. Um, 
Now, at that point, if I start projecting upon them something like, I would like to cook up with you and then they, they, you don't hear from them, so you send them another one, <laughs> another email or another message or another phone message on the phone or you go around and knock on the door. Now what are you starting to do? Well, to be frank, you're harassing them, right? <laughs> and, it, and if you're harassing them, right, obviously that's not harmonious with love either. Right? And there's an emotion inside of myself that needs to be healed if I want to harass somebody. Right? So when I first met Mary, I knew she was my soulmate. But I could see Mary was in some emotional turmoil from previous relationship and other things like that. And so I didn't say to Mary that she, that I didn't tell her that she was my soulmate. I now regret not telling her that she was my soulmate. But I just felt like, oh, she would never accept me anyway. So this was my unhealed emotion. She would never accept me anyway. She still got hurt from a previous relationship that I can feel she was working through. And, and I just felt like, well, at least I now know who my soulmate is. That's the feeling I had. And, but I didn't project anything at Mary at all. I didn't tell her that she, I didn't even tell her that she was my soulmate. I just, uh, I just sort of, I, I, one of the persons I was with guessed that I knew it was Mary, and, and, but that's about it. I didn't really even talk about it much with anyone, aside from obviously there being a big change in me that other people could see that I'd met my soulmate, right? And, uh, and so, yeah, I'd met my soulmate. If someone had said, have you, have you met your soulmate? I'd say, yeah, I've met my soulmate. Now, at that point, we could go down this track of being very, very demanding upon the person, couldn't we? And very controlling and very manipulative. We could do all sorts of things which will all be out of harmony with love. Right? Or we could just, in the end, have the courage to just go to them and just say, which I did not have, by the way, the courage to do this, you could go and just say to them, you're my soulmate, I know you're my soulmate, I don't know what to do about it, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you're my soulmate, right? <laughs> and, and just let the chips fall where it may. Right? That is, and on a, honestly, the most direct and honest and open approach is the one that's most in harmony with God's laws. Does that make sense? And because it's so most in harmony with God's laws, there's a high li higher likelihood that everything will happen a lot more smoothly than if we do something that's out of harmony with God's laws. Now, ironically, with Mary, if, if I had said that to Mary, Mary probably would have had a lot less trouble with me afterwards than she actually did have um, because, because it, it would have given her an opportunity to hear it straight from me as to how I felt. But uh, for us, that didn't occur. But what I'm recommending is Go ahead and do that yourself. But if you're a guy like me who had a lot of uh, self-esteem issues and felt like your soulmate would probably reject you and all those kind of things, then you won't be able to do that. You'll probably first have to go home and have some cries like I did uh, and, work my way, and work your way through that emotion right? before you'll be able to feel like you can do that. Do you want to say, Mary? Or do you want to come up, darling? Or you don't really feel up to coming up, do you? I, I still want to talk about this issue of longing because... Um, yeah, I'm not finished with it. <laughs> can I, can I talk yeah, yeah. about it? Yeah, go because ahead. it's actually, I feel you have had a strong connection with your soulmate longing all your life, but yeah. it's actually something that I, even we're in a relationship and I find it quite confronting. Yeah. Um, because a longing is not a need or a demand or... So even after you met me, you still longed for me mm -hmm. and that... that wasn't a projection at me, that was a longing. Mm. Um, so you didn't have a sense of um, that I had to do anything, but you still were in a state of longing. And, and I believe a really um, a, a beautiful state, it's like a childlike state that you had around me mm. of wanting to know about me and wanting to know me. And it, it was very beautiful. Um, even though some people are quite critical of that now. Yeah. I found it very beautiful to be the recipient of that. Yeah. Um, but for me, even when we're in a relationship, to be in a state of longing is a very vulnerable place. Mm. It's a place where you, you, you're without need but you're in pure desire for that other person. Yeah. And I'm still, even though um, 
I feel that is beginning for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm so just because you're even in a relationship with a person with your soulmate doesn't mean that your soulmate longing is established. Yeah. And even I'm working through a lot of my man issues. It still doesn't mean my soulmate longing starts. I have to deal with the fear of total openness and vulnerability. Yeah. So I think when people talk about soulmate longing, it's really important to uh, know what that state really is about. And it's not a uh, oh, I want that man, sort of a feeling. Yeah. yeah. What, what if I define it for you, what a soulmate longing is? Thank you, Mary. Right. Yeah, and what, what Mary says is very true. Like, it's just, uh, even being with a soulmate, you may not have a soulmate longing, right? What is soulmate longing is having a passionate, desire to Feel your own feelings for your soulmate. Right. So, in other words, it's not you automatically saying or, or trying to connect with them and have them have feelings for you. Right. This is about you developing within yourself a passionate desire to feel your own feelings about this one other person who eventually you will have in your life. That's all it is. And this passionate desire passes through you. Right? It's not something that you're giving to the other person necessarily. It's passing through you. Right? And it's felt by you for the other person. Feelings inside of yourself for the other person. Now what's happened, what happened for me with this longing was one of the biggest things that shut down my longing was my grief for my soulmate. So for many, many years I thought I had a longing for my soulmate when in reality what I was doing was acting upon my grief for my soulmate. Does that make sense? In my case I'm conscious of my soulmate leaving my life in the process of incarnation there's this humongous grief inside of me about that, right? And because of that grief that I was unwilling to feel, I was actually projecting neediness at my soulmate for almost all of my life. Now, of course, my soulmate is feeling this projection, and is she going to be attracted to that? No, of course not, right? So I was actually repelling my soulmate with this needy emotion. What happened was that I had to then realise, or go through these realisations, that I was projecting at my soulmate this needy emotion. And once I worked my way through that, I then started to truly grieve the loss that I felt inside of me for her. Now, that grief lasted me nearly three and a half years of crime most days. Uh, that's how much grief I had. And I still probably got a little bit left because I can still feel it there inside of me, this grief about the loss of my soulmate. And I had to deal with a fair majority of that grief before I would even meet Mary. Because up until that time, I was projecting this need at her, trying to shut down my grief. She had a role up until that point, and the role that she had was that she would have to make me feel good, <laughs> you know, to get away from my grief about losing my soulmate, right? Once I started to own my grief about dealing, uh, losing my soulmate and really letting all of that go, which took quite a few years for me, I then started to draw Mary and get closer to Mary in our emotional state. So she was overseas at the time, but I could still feel... Her, I started to feel her personality. I started to feel her personality again. You know, it was like a memory process for me, but I started to feel her personality again. I started to feel her characteristics and attributes. I even started to feel a lot of her injuries that she had at, towards men and towards what she would have towards myself and things like that. And I started to feel a lot more about that because I was feeling my passionate desire for her and I could even feel her blockages towards me. Now, every time I allowed myself to feel my passionate desire for her, I could feel the blockage that she had towards me, which naturally got me straight away into my grief. Because I just thought, oh, my soulmate doesn't want me in her life. I could feel that, right? 
So that caused me to go into this state of grief and feel more and more of my grief. So when you have a passionate desire to feel your own feelings about your soulmate, for your soulmate, and when you think about it, having a longing for God is very similar. It's having a passionate desire to feel your own feelings for God. Does that make sense? So it's not about God's feelings for you initially when you long for God. It's about your feelings longing for God. That's what draws the love to you. That's what draws the reciprocant love to you. So the desire is about being passionate, have a passionate desire within yourself to experience the feelings that you actually have. Now, you can do that whether the person's in a relationship or not. Because at this point, you're not projecting anything at the person. In fact, you're the projecting the least amount at them because you're owning and feeling all of your own emotions of longing. The irony is when you passionately feel all of your own feelings about something, that's when everyone around you feels your feelings the least amount. Does that make sense? In other words, they don't feel it as a projection or anything like that. They can just feel it as love instead. So it doesn't, there's no blockages between you and them when you do this. But when you have a passionate desire to feel your own emotions and a passionate desire to feel your own feelings for somebody, you are actually feeling what's inside of yourself for them. And that feeling is allowed to grow and grow and grow as much as you desire that feeling to grow. But to be frank with you, many of you will want to turn it off because you'll feel such a sense of loss because of some things that have happened in your parents' lives and whatever else, you'll feel these overwhelming emotions that you'll want to shut it all down, right? My suggestion is stay open and vulnerable to it. So I had to stay open and vulnerable to the fact my soulmate didn't want me. Does that make sense? And I could feel that and allow myself to feel that. And even when I met her, I realised how much she didn't want me right at the point that I met her. Before then, I was sort of flirting with the idea, well, maybe I'm wrong, you know, maybe she does really want me or whatever. But as soon as I met her, I realised that, wow, there's no longing there for me at all in, in my soulmate. None at all. I could feel there was no longing. Now, there was lots of grief in me associated with that, and I had to be vulnerable and open to experience that grief. Does that make sense? I had to let myself feel how sad I felt about the fact my own soulmate didn't even want to remember me. Right? And I went through lots and lots of different emotions about that. Now, as I dealt with those emotions, her, her sort of disinterest in me changed. Uh, it went from disinterest into anger. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, the reason why it went from disinterest into anger is because she's now starting to feel some of these feelings, right? inside of herself and that's triggering some stuff inside of her of her grief that she didn't want to feel and so now she's starting to get in turmoil emotional turmoil the more i long for her and just felt my own feelings with i don't need to project it at her at all i just long for her and feel my own feelings of longing that automatically causes the other person to start feeling some things inside of themselves because the blockage between the two halves has been released can you see that? The only reason why there's not emotions permanently flowing between you and your soulmate right now is because you and your soulmate have both have blockages towards each other. Right? So when you start pulling out those blockages, those sort of like, you could think of them like pulling out the barbs or the arrows of pain that are in you about connecting to this other person. When you pull them out of yourself, there's now an openness on your side towards your soulmate you are now emotionally open to receiving them right and emotionally open to giving to them without expectation now that has a huge effect on your soulmate how can it not have a huge effect like once you start doing this and so in the end what it really gets back down to is how much am i willing to heal my own stuff and how much am I willing to have a passionate desire to feel my own emotions for my soulmate? That's really what it gets down to in the end, as to how we will come together in the future at some point. Now, if I allow myself to do this, what will happen, whether she's in a relationship, not in a relationship, whatever, 
things will start changing in her life. In my case, I'm talking from uh, a male's perspective, or you, if you're talking from a female's perspective, things will start changing in his life, that he will just, just his life will start changing. Because there's one person on this planet who no longer has a heap of blockages towards him, who happens to be his other half. Right? That is going to have a powerful effect on his, him and his life. Unfortunately, he will often think, or she will often think, that it's done without their will. <laughs> but that's how it goes. Because you are, it's the whole soul that's got the will, not the two halves. The two halves certainly have will, but it's the entire soul that can feel its emotions. And so when one half of the soul stops being blocked to the other half of the soul, of course the other half of the soul's life is going to be affected by the process. Now, let's say they're in the relationship. They're in another relationship. And I know who it is now, who my soulmate is. There is still no harm in just going up to them and saying, I know you're my soulmate. I just want to tell you. Is there really? What's the difference between if they're in a relationship or not in a relationship? If you have no expectation, then all you're doing is presenting a truth to a person who happens to be your other half. In fact, don't they deserve the truth more than any other person? I think my battery's starting to go, maybe. Don't they deserve the truth more than any other person in your life? Of course they do. So just go up and tell them. <laughs> Needs a lot of courage. Just go up and tell them. But as soon as again you have an expectation that they act upon the information that you've given them, what are you doing? You're being unloving to them and also to their partner. So you're actually being unloving to two people, not just your soulmate, but also whoever they're with. And as soon, if your soulmate says, oh, wow, yeah, I feel like you're my soulmate too. Let's go and have an affair. <laughs> Obviously now both of you are being unloving to each other and also to the partner of your soulmate. You would have to go through quite a lot of different emotions, wouldn't you, to sort out the relationship. Now, now those emotions might be worked through, like I've seen some people work through them in one week. Right? In the spirit world, I've seen them work through it in one hour of your time here on earth. Like one hour, bang, like everything's dealt with basically. Like they've been with a person even in the spirit world for all of their life like for hundreds of years sometimes, and then they meet their soulmate and they go back, you're my soulmate. Oh. You know, like, and then they say to their partner, we're not meant to be together, are we? And sometimes they say, no, we're not. Sometimes they say, yes, we are. But either way, you can feel this strong bond between yourself and your soulmate once you're open to it emotionally, and you'll know you've got to go. I've seen someone go, I've talked to a spirit who went in, in about 30 seconds. <laughs> What, what happened is that there was this couple that came to me to talk to me about he was the the man was in the uh, in the uh, second sphere of the spirit world the woman was in the hells of the spirit world right because the man had been dominated by her all of his life and even in the spirit even in the spirit world he decided that he had to help her somehow and they both came to me because they wanted to know why she was in the hills when he was in a different better place and so I told him it was because she dominated you all of your life and she's not sorry for that. Right? And she got really upset with me about that but she stayed in the conversation. And then, and then I started talking to the man and, uh, and, he, and I started talking about the concept of soulmates. And, and she said, oh, he's not my soulmate. She said, she was in the hills and she said, he's not my soulmate. And as soon as she said that, a third spirit come along and said, I'm your soulmate. <laughs> and the woman who had been hanging around this man, the, 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 her, her husband from earth in the spirit world for seven years since she'd passed, right? And she'd been hanging around him, pestering him and, and, and causing him lots of trouble still, trying to get him to come down to her all the time. She just ran off. And that's the last he saw of her. Right? And then we started, I started talking to the man and he started realising actually that his soulmate wasn't a woman anyway. His soulmate was a male. And as soon as he had that realisation, he found his own soulmate. These conversations happen, right? And, 
So can you see how rapidly in the spirit world it can all change? The reason why it doesn't change as rapidly here is because we are often so addicted, as I had written up there before, to all of these different emotions that we don't want to face these emotions. And a lot of these addictions, by the time we pass, have gone. So, for instance, you're not going to be addicted to your house on 48 Coggle Drive, you know, down here. You're not going to be addicted to your house when you pass, are you? No, you've given up that addiction. But on earth, you think you're going to be addicted to that? Sure you are. If it's a nice, pretty house and, and you've spent 30 years building a garden and, you know, everything, you want a half of it even if you're going, right? But in the spirit world, you don't care about that, do you? Like, you wouldn't want a half of the house in the spirit world, would you? So, so why would you bother doing it here? You see, a lot of times we have these unhealed emotions here on earth that cause us to enter into these unloving transactions then once we have these realisations. That's what I'm getting at. And, and that's the trouble a lot of the times on earth. We get into these un... So why wouldn't... Assume, let's say I'd approached my soulmate and she's married and I just said, look, I, I feel you're my soulmate. I've realised that you're my soulmate. I've known it now for a while. I just wanted to tell you. And I'll catch you later. <laughs> Well, you will catch her later because there will be some time in the spirit world you'll catch her if not on earth, right? So sooner or later, she's yours, man, right? So, um, so, so you could just leave it at that, couldn't you? That's having no expectation at the outcome. Now, she could then feel about it and go, wow, yeah, I've always felt this kind of strange feeling with him. And, you know, she start to feel about all of those things. But then if she starts approaching you without discussing it with her husband, she is way out of line now morally, isn't she? She would first have to go and talk to her husband. You know, I'm starting to have some realisations that you and I are not probably meant to be together and that there's this other guy who I've known from my childhood I haven't had a relationship or have many years ago or whatever, but he's, he's the man who I'm with and, and I know that, he's probably fe that he feels the same way. He, he told me a few weeks ago that he's feeling the same way. You'd be open and honest about the whole thing, wouldn't you? if you were dealing with things in love and in truth. But most of the time what we do is we don't want to deal with it in love and truth because we're afraid of the outcome. So let's say the man went along and told the woman that he's a soulmate and she's married, so she goes straight to her husband and says, look, this guy thinks he's my soulmate. Right? She could easily do that, couldn't she? Why wouldn't she do that if she really loved him? Of course she would do that if she really loved him, wouldn't she? Now she might not believe the man who came, who, her soulmate, she might not believe him at all, but she still needs to tell her husband because there, there should be openness and honesty and truth between the partnership. And if there's not, then you've got to start questioning what kind of relationship there is. Does that make sense? So, so she would just go straight to him and say, oh, I had this, this guy came up to me the other day and, and I had this, uh, he said, he thinks he's my soulmate. What do you think of that? <laughs> like, and you could even discuss it with your friend. And, and you could just say, oh, do you know what I mean? And just wave it all off. She could do anything. She could wave it all off. She could think about it. She could have a realisation herself. Who knows what might happen after that? And if I'm her soulmate, it is none of my business what happens after that, actually. Right? And as, if I pester her, try to control her, try to manipulate her, try to influence her in any way, all I am doing is being having a lack of integrity that sooner or later is damaging my own soul, which means it's also damaging her. Right? So I can, I can stop doing all of that, just not do all of that, just state the truth. So if she rings me up, the first thing I would say is, does your husband know you're ringing me up? And she says, oh, no, no. I would say, well, I can't have this conversation with you. He needs to know that you're calling me. That's what I would do if I had integrity, wouldn't it be? Right? But if I didn't have integrity, I'd go, oh, it's so exciting, my soulmate, she's ringing me up now, and I'll talk to her for 10 minutes before I realise, actually, this is, out of hand. this is out of line already. This is out of line because her husband doesn't even know she's calling me. That's why it's out of line. Right? Then I need to address that issue, you see? The problem is a lot of times we become so enthusiastic about it that we start compromising morals. And we start compromising truth, compromising integrity, which is all compromising love in the end. And as soon as we compromise love, there can only be a poor outcome. 
even if it's with our soulmate. So my suggestion is to never do that, never compromise those things. Be in integrity. So what happened with myself and Mary was Mary sends me a little email on Valentine's Day, February the 14th it was. Uh, she sends me an email saying, I heard from my parents that you think that you and I have some kind of soul connection. Please tell me what you... Oh, I want to know, firstly, what you think about this and secondly, why you have not discussed this with me yourself. <laughs> that was Mary's, <laughs> Mary's email. All right. And she was spot on, right? In both cases, like, firstly, why haven't I discussed it with her myself? Because basically I was gutless and I had a heap of emotions to work through. <laughs> basically, well, that's the truth, right? And so I had to work through those emotions, uh, which I did do over that month and a half period before she contacted me, obviously. And then she asked me a question. Now, you know, everyone who was with me at the time, they, says, they said to me, oh, don't, don't go too heavy on her, you know, don't you tell her what's really going down, you know, just give her a little bit and then she asked for a bit more. And I'm going, what? Like, what? No, I'm just going to lay it all out on the table which is what I should have done at the start. Right? Because that's the, most thing, that's the thing that's most harmonious with love and truth. So I say to her, I, I email her back, yes, I just believe you are my soulmate. Um, I'm Jesus, by the way, which she knew anyway. Um, and, and I feel you're Mary Magdalene. And, 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 uh, and then I started just, I just described how I felt, and it's an email that she recently read again and still cries a lot about, actually, um, when she reads it. And I, it was 12 pages long. Um, <laughs> I just, like, said what I felt to her. Now, I still had no expectation. Like, I, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't think that, like, anything would come of it because I still could feel some connections she had to an old relationship. I could still feel that she had quite a lot of anger with me, right? quite a lot of personal anger with me from our first century m memories and, and quite a lot of stuff like that that I felt like, no, nah, like what I felt was going to happen was that Mary would leave Australia, go back overseas to a, a refugee camp somewhere and work in a refugee camp for a few years and over that time she'd probably think about it. And, uh, and I was hopeful at some point in the future if I was travelling past her and some, one of her around the world trip I was doing, that I might be able to pop in and say hello, you know. That was basically the, be the most uh, that I was feeling would probably happen. And I was just allowing myself to feel the sadness of that as well. You know what I mean? Like, to feel the sadness that it, nothing's going to happen from here. You know, I've just written the 12 pages that are going to freak her out, something shocking. And the truth is, they did, the 12 pages did freak her out. Like, um, because it connected her with some emotions within herself that then she started to feel that really stressed her out, right? Right at that time. I'm just talking about you, darling. Sorry about that. Um, so, so what happened was that I, I was there, I'd written this 12-page response to Mary from Mary's email and I described my feelings. That's all I did, just my feelings. I just described my feelings. And I also said to her, she didn't have to trust me. She didn't have to do anything. She didn't have to respond. I was just happy that she'd given me an opportunity to express my feelings. And I also apologised to her that I hadn't expressed my feelings sooner um, and she had to hear my feelings from somebody else, uh, which was something that upset Mary that she had to do. And so um, at that point, I didn't really expect any reply or anything like that. I just felt my feelings about it. I was overseas by this point and Mary was in Australia. And, uh, and then, I, then a few days later I get another email from Mary asking a few more questions which I replied to directly, not again with any expectations. And then we just, Mary started asking more questions which I replied to directly and so forth. But in the process we started to develop um, a friendship basically. And, and eventually they said, oh, am I, can I call you? And it took about a week for Mary to decide whether that was on or not, didn't it, darling? And, and, 
And of course, Mary wasn't in a relationship. If Mary was in a relationship, I would not have even spoken to her again until she had owned up to the person she was in a relationship with, um, what was actually going on. But she, because she wasn't in a relationship, we could have a free conversation, which we did, and the free conversation just grew from there. Now, Mary appropriately pointed out to me that I did not say to her what I felt initially and that I should have. And that's why I'm telling you as well that it would be the wisest thing to do if you know who your soulmate is, just go and tell them the truth without expectation. Right? Because when I look at back at that, I have a bit of sadness about it too because I feel like I should have too. Like I feel like it would have been much better uh, now, I don't know if anything would have been different, but it would have been much better if I had actually just come out for my own sake and said the truth. As it turned out, it was Mary's parents who told her that I felt um, she was my soulmate, and they'd found out from somebody else who told them and, <laughs> and so forth. So um, it was a real long-winded thing uh, that, uh, that they, she was eventually told. And, and I feel like it would have been much better coming from me. Uh, than coming through this roundabout, circuitous, is it cir circuitous. circuitous route, uh, which was obviously quite upsetting for Mary. And, and looking back on it, I can see driven totally by my own emotional injury. So, so as this uh, relationship starts growing then, we can start working through the different emotions. Does that make sense? And when I say growing, initially for many, time, for many people, when you meet your soulmate, it's not going to be, you know, there's going to be anger and other types of emotions to work your way through. It's not, a lot of people think it's going to be like, oh, meet my soulmate, everything's wonderful from that moment on. Well, that can't, cannot be the case because you've got emotional injuries inside of you and so do they have emotional injuries inside of them and error only comes out of you with pain. Like error creates pain inside of you and the only way error can come out is in a painful manner, right? So we've got to come to accept the fact that if I'm, if I'm going to come together with my soulmate, it's going to be some painful emotions that I'm going to have to deal with myself and my soulmate's going to have to have some painful emotions that she's going to have to deal with herself because we have this pain in us from the error that's in us. And we need to release this painful pro through this process just the same way as if we had a passionate desire for God and we'd be growing towards God, releasing our pains along the way. Exactly the same way. That's the beauty of the soulmate relationship. It just helps you grow on the path towards God as well. So by the time I've done all of that, what will end up is that I'm actually now feeling all of my emotions in humility and truth as I described I have this passionate desire burning in my own heart for my soulmate, immaterial to what she has going on for me. Right? And if she has nothing going on for me, I feel my grief about that. I don't project it at her. I don't blame her. You're my soulmate. You should love me. I don't, you know, don't do all of that stuff. I don't even, as soon as I feel that stuff, I am out of harmony with love. And I need to go inside of myself and start uh, look at myself and say, why am I projecting this terrible emotion that my soulmate has to do what I want? Why am I doing that? There's an unloving emotion inside of me causing that to occur. Does that make sense? All right, so now that I've described that process, do you have any questions about the process? Go up to the back to Jen up there if we can. And then down the front here and then across. A while back I told you I thought I knew who my soulmate was. Um, I'm doubting that now. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure whether I'm doubting it because it's just too painful or whether it's um, true. A lot of things have happened in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I have um, told him I thought he was my soulmate but I had huge expectations so he shut down and I emotionally melted down all over the place. Yeah. Uh, he really doesn't want anything to do with me, but we do share a house. 
so it's a little complicated. Yeah. And a couple of weeks ago, he actually pushed me to go out with another man. Yep. So... Which, if the soulmate part of your soul was open, you wouldn't have done. Sorry? If the soulmate part of your soul was open, you wouldn't have actually gone out with the other man, even if your soulmate pushed you into doing it. Gee, you know everything, don't you? Because yeah. I didn't even tell you. I went and had coffee with him two days exactly. ago. Exactly. <laughs> but... So can you see that actually yeah. there's a lot of the grief, the meltdown grief that you were feeling, you need to go into that, mm. right? That's the emotion you're avoiding now and you need to go into that emotion. Many people do this. They go out and tell their soulmate that the soulmate, the soulmate has no response and the person then just goes into this rage and anger and meltdown about, or, or meltdown about the fact that their soulmate's not responding. Well, that's your projection at your soulmate that you need to heal before your soulmate's ever going to respond. Mm. I've had, there was one lady I knew overseas, as soon as she told her soulmate and he told her he wasn't really interested, she then just pursued him relentlessly. And eventually she got him to go to bed with her and he still doesn't treat her very well at all, right? Still, it didn't treat her very well at all. They're not together and she still pursued him. That is totally out of harmony with love, right? And also, even if my soulmate tells me that I should go and be with somebody else, if I am connected to my soulmate and open at my soul level to my soulmate, I would never be able to do that. Yeah, yeah I understand that from yesterday. Yeah. Um, well, the last few days, but yesterday was a great eye opener for me, and and I realised all that. Uh, I am still very confused, though. But now I understand that all I have to do is work on my emotions. Yep. Um, I was a little confused about my feelings working on my feelings of desire for my soulmate without projecting because honestly um, a friend of mine told me the other day that I was projecting and I didn't realize I was projecting mm -hmm. so I have to learn that I'm projecting you know I have to recognize that yep. that I'm projecting yep. um, so now I'm uh, I'm just really, I'm in a state of fear about all sorts of things happening at the moment and I just, I just don't know where to go with it. I know intellectually I have to just work on all my own feelings and I hope I'm doing that. Yeah. Is that the solution? It is a solution but let's, let's talk about your personal situation a bit more because it, it does illustrate some really important points, right, in terms of what we need to do emotionally. So, so here's you, here's your guy right over there, here's you, and you go and tell him the truth that you feel. Now, at that point, everything's fine. You're now in, harm, you're in harmony of truth, and you've told the truth to this man. Everything's fine at this point, right? Yes. What happened was he then responded with rejection, right? Yeah. So he rejected you. What's playing out now is your relationship with your father. Yes, right? I know that. He is, is that the perfect reflection of my father okay. and what I'm trying to get from my father. Okay. Now, he rejects you. Now, if your soulmate rejects you, trust me, it's one of the most difficult emotions to deal with inside of yourself because it, you feel the pain of, it, of the other half of yourself rejecting you, mm. right? which is really, really big, big emotion. Now, if I haven't dealt with rejection of my father before I meet my soulmate, then my soulmate is going to be the person who actually triggers it. Yeah. All right? So what I need to do is let myself feel those emotions pass through me of rejection. As soon as I... But you went... You actually, when you told him, you went in with an expectation. Yeah. Right? Which is an unloving in the first place, right? The expectation... What the expect, I can't spell either. You all know that, don't you? All right? So, um, so I went in with an expectation. Yes. Going in with an expectation was already unloving. And of course it's going to invoke an unloving response probably. Mm. Uh, very rare for a loving action to re to an unloving action to re invoke a loving response. Yes. <laughs> right? This person has to be pretty developed if they get a loving response out of them with, after an unloving reaction. So, so what happened is you get a reaction of rejection, which is actually an unhealed father emotion inside of you, right? 
Yeah. So it's something that's not healed inside of you that needs to be healed. So let yourself go ahead and feel that overwhelming experience that you believe this person's your soulmate and you just got rejected by them. Mm. How does that make you feel about yourself? If your own soulmate's going to reject you, yeah. wow, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? Like in terms of, can you see how there must be oh, some yeah. pretty deep emotions yeah. there? Now what happens inside of you is that you didn't want to feel those emotions. Mm. Now as soon as we try to block off the emotion, now we're projecting instantly. The first person you're going to be projecting at is the person who rejected you. Yeah. You're going to be projecting him quite strongly, right? Mm. Now your first response might be anger or whatever it is, or try to withdraw and run away or whatever that. Mm. But whatever it is, it's still a projection at them, which would be better off, better served if you could just start to heal this rejection emotion by feeling it. Yeah. So just have some good cries. Mm. Like so, so. When I felt rejection from my soulmate, which happened about four or five months uh, after we got together, and we then went apart for a while, for nearly th for three months, I cried for five hours a day for three months. <laughs> mm. right? But some people would say that I'm a bit of a tear, <laughs> or whatever. But that's what happened. I just cried five hours a day for three months, and I went through lots of different realizations in the process. Lots of so many different realizations, and one of the biggest realizations I had at the end of the process, which was that I was actually being unloving to her. Like, and I started going through a lot of these emotions about these projections coming out of me still, like uh, towards my soulmate, right? And what I did is I went into those emotions and I felt all of those emotions. And then I started connecting to the truth. And that was that I actually believed that I was unworthy of my soulmate. Yeah, very much. Right? Mm -hmm. And then I started feeling all those groups of emotions. And after I came out of that group of emotions, I knew my soulmate would call me in a few days' time. Just knew it. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, Mary rang me two days later. Um, yeah. Just in the last couple of years, uh, I have been saying to my father, I love you, Dad. Mm -hmm. And his response is, thank you. And I've been trying to get him to say, I love you. Exactly. Because I don't, I don't remember him ever saying, I love you to me. He yeah. could have when I was a little girl. You know and I know I've been trying to get this man to say, I love you. You've been to trying me. to manipulate him into yeah. telling you that yeah. he loves you. And the truth is that when you heal the emotion inside of you, he will probably then automatically tell you without you manipulating him into it. Could he... I'm concerned that because this man is reflecting my father to me so strongly... Yep that that could be the reason why I think he's my soulmate and he isn't? Yep. So you want to tell me whether he is or he isn't? No. Nope. <laughs> okay, I'll take that as a positive. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean as a positive that I have to work on my emotions to find out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. you see why politicians say no comment? <laughs> any comment is taken yeah. or something. All right. Yeah, so what I'm saying to you is that how are you really going to know that this man is your soulmate until you heal this emotion with regard to your father? Yeah. And also, even if he is your soulmate and you know, this emotion in regard to your father still has to be healed, healed. before yeah. anything's going to change. So either way, whatever goes on, you still need to let yourself feel this terrible emotion of being rejected by your soulmate, the person you think is your soulmate. What a lot of people do, they go down, oh, my soulmate wouldn't have rejected me, so they can't be my soulmate. Yeah. What? Like, yes, your soulmate's just as capable of rejecting you as everybody else. Right? So how, how, how does that logic? There's no logic in that. So, so can you see how it's just a matter of dealing with this emotion? I need to deal with this emotion, which comes from my father, as you correct, correctly identify, not from this man. Mm. And all this man is doing is reflecting it. And by the way, I also have to deal with the fact that I had an unloving expectation. Yeah. Why did I have that? There's another emotion in that. Mm. Why did I have that? I need to work, so must work through that particular mm. emotion. Now, when I do that, the more I do that, the more I work my way through my unhealed emotion. It doesn't matter what my soulmate does. 
they will eventually be drawn to me because I've dealt with those emotions. They are not going to be drawn to you by browbeating them. Mm. Oh, but no. It do definitely you? doesn't work, people. Yeah, exactly. definitely, doesn't definitely doesn't work. Doesn't work. Yeah. I want to... Next time I say, I love you, Dad, I want to say to him, why don't you say, I love you back to me? Can I just address... But I'm too scared. I, I don't know whether that's first, right or not. Can I just address your first comment, though? The yeah. truth is you don't love your dad. That's probably very true. All right? Yeah. So you're telling him a lie just to get a response. Okay. That in the end would also be a lie. Okay. Um, so obviously that's not going to work out. Mm. You, the time you will love your dad is when you truly feel all of the healed emotions inside of you. All the unhealed stuff is all gone. Yeah. And you've healed your stuff towards your dad. Mm. At that moment, you will love your dad. Okay. And at that moment, your dad will probably feel it from you. Now, he might not respond to it, but yeah. he will at least feel it from you. At the moment, what he's feeling from you is anger. Wow. All right? Yeah. And he, and he knows just as well as you do that it's not real. Okay. Yeah. I was talking to Mary before and something profound happened yesterday. I realised through someone else's comment that I didn't have a connection, I couldn't have a connection with God and I couldn't work out why. And I realised this morning that I don't have an emotional connection, a connection of emotions towards God. And that's how I feel about my father. I feel like I wasn't given an emotional connection from him and I can't give him an emotional connection and it's the same with my mother. So when someone said to me the other day, you know, think of God as a woman, I thought that's not going to work either. Yep. Um, so I want to open up an emotional connection with God because I know that if I do that, this is going to help everything else too. Yep. So how do I open up an emotional connection to God? Very good question. The way you do it is by relieving the blockage. So the blockage is God is going to... Re if God's a male, what's God going to do to you? Reject me. Yes. I need to feel the emotion of rejection by God. Right? So even though it's not true, God isn't rejecting you, you've got to forget that. The truth is you feel rejected by God. So feel that emotion. Feel it. And when you feel it and connect to it, you'll connect with this rejection to your dad and you'll release the causal emotion of that. At the moment, what's happening is you're trying to establish an emotional connection without releasing the blockage to the connection. And it's the blockage that prevents this emotion from flowing in you. See, many of us do the same thing. We think we can intellectually establish a relationship with someone or that we can intellectually establish a relationship with God. The truth is you can't. It all has to be done emotionally. So if I have a blockage inside of me to feeling that God's going to reject me, then my, my feeling is I can try to skip over that and say, no, God wouldn't reject me. I know the truth. God doesn't reject anyone. But that's immaterial. The feeling inside of me is God has rejected me. What I need to feel is that feeling completely. God's rejected me. Go into that feeling and release that feeling. When you release that feeling, the error that God's going to reject me is gone. And at that moment, you can have a longing for God and feel some divine love flow through you because you no longer feel you're going to be rejected by God. See, love can't flow through you until you're in a state of emotional truth about the issue. Right? So the emotional truth about the issue is that God will not reject me. Right? That's the emotional truth inside of myself about the issue. That, sorry, that's the real emotional truth about the issue, but it may not be inside of myself. It has to be inside of myself before the connection will be truly established. So the only way for that to happen is for me to release the error that's already in there because truth and error can't reside in the same location at the same time. I can't, on one hand, have this huge emotion in me that God's going to reject me and, on the other hand, have a pure longing for God at the same time. Because my longing for God is always going to be tainted by the fact that God's going to reject me. And it's the same with your husband, or sorry, your soulmate, right? And, and that's related all to your father. A whole lot of that's related to your father. And this is why sometimes meeting your soulmate or even believing someone to be your soulmate can be a huge emotional trigger if you accept it. Because whatever they give back to you is a part of your law of attraction that's going to heal your relationship with God your relationship with yourself and also, in the end, your relationship with 
your soulmate, whoever that is, whether it's the person you imagine it to be or someone different. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, thank you, Jody. Yep. So, so the, I suppose the moral of that story is to actually allow yourself to speak the truth, but understand that every time you have an expectation, that is unloving, and whatever response you get back, that is your law of attraction. Does that make sense? So if my soulmate rejects me, if the person I feel is my soulmate rejects me, that is my law of attraction. I've got some unhealed emotion to work through there. Inside of me, not them. They, they, they've got some unhealed emotion too, perhaps, if they're my soulmate. They might certainly have. But that's immaterial. I can't control what they're doing. I can't control what they see. All I can do is do my own stuff, right? So all I can do is own my own feelings. Right? So when Mary said to me, I don't want to I really see you, well, it didn't really happen like that, but it just, it just happened where we eventually just didn't see each other for a period of time because of the circumstances. All I did was just go into my emotion about that. Right? Mary didn't feel attracted to me, she didn't want me, or all those kind of emotions, and I just went through that. Now I knew that it was happening because she was afraid, and I knew that it was happening because of her fear of some family issues and so forth, right? Now, I could have just told myself, oh, it's just because she's afraid. It's just because she... And then that would help me just skip over all the emotion that I felt. Right? Forget about doing that. Don't tell yourself all the stories, even if they're true. Right? Allow yourself just to feel the truthful emotional response that you have with inside of yourself. That's what will clear it.